Okay, that's enough of that. I think it's obvious at this point. I have nothing positive to say. After all, this isn't about love or trust, like an out-of-touch writer's room with fictionalized friends. This is about lies, deceit, and exploit. Like actual friends. Anywho, today I want to discuss the show that somehow managed to hold an audience's attention for 10 seasons, make a resurgence in the past decade, and manage to come back once more due to the tragic passing of Matthew Perry. Now, despite what my content might suggest, I do like to live and let live, but this show has almost absurdly grown popularity and it felt more like a trend than an outpouring of fans crawling out of the gutters, cracked dens, and bushes where homeless people go to f Something about this almost felt supernatural. The show first aired way back in 1994 and toddler me did not understand what I was being subjected to, but my parents were fascinated these characters gathered around a couch in a crappy coffee shop. Hey Ross, I got this gig playing a dead corpse in an anti-drug ad. Oh, I bet Rachel would look great as a dead corpse. <laughs> hey, I forgot to mention, I ran into Rachel and that smoking cougar Sandra, and I got a number. Joey, that's Rachel's mom. You can't hook up with her. <laughs> Since you put it that way, the threesome they were talking about sounded a lot freakier. Oh no, how can my day get any more depressing? Ten bucks and I'll let you watch. Make it eight and I get to film. You know, really scary shit like that. Fast forward 20 years and it feels like the nightmare is finally behind me. I'm no longer getting arrested for aggravated assault towards everyone named Joey. I no longer have to consume copious amounts of alcohol to step anywhere near a coffee shop. And best of all, it seemed Courtney Cox had fallen off the face of the earth. She didn't. She was just narrating tales of the crypt or something. I kind of forgot about it and I put it to the back of my mind until out of nowhere I'm seeing compilation clips, best moments, best of Chandler, a Me Too counter for Joey or whatever the f that was about. And there's no build up to it. I don't remember any creator coming out and stating it was like the best show they've ever seen or a bunch of popular media articles covering its top 10 best Ross and Rachel Cox scenes. So to better understand, I needed to take this from a different perspective. Obviously, as a toddler in the early 90s, I wasn't flipping over to NBC to watch this piece of shit dumpster fire. But even so, my parents watched every tiresome joke, every poorly written stereotype, every scene with Jennifer Aniston's glass cutters penetrating at least three layers of clothing. And like a repressed memory of an unfortunate encounter with my gym teacher, I was shocked to find that my parents can't even remember liking the show. They must have because they watched it, but how much of that was part of an NBC social experiment working in accordance with the government conspiracy? But I bet you think that sounds a bit traumatic. Well, what about this? Or this? Or even this? I don't want to start pointing fingers, but something isn't adding up. Teenagers and young adults that can't even afford ramen, watching a show where six people can afford four different apartments in the fifth most expensive neighborhood in Manhattan. I mean, look at the filmography list of the writers and creators of this show. Have you heard of anything on this list before or after Friends? I didn't think so. The humor was sold as timeless. Don't you have a little too much penis to be wearing a dress like that? Hello, Tons. And there's Daddy. How goes the dancing? Gay yet? Joey, that bag is gonna get you that part. And a date with a man. Here's an example of the humor without a laugh track. I dare you to find what's funny. Tell her she's not marriage material. Hi, hi. You know, we were just talking about bacon. <laughs> no, we were talking about tennis. Tennis is more believable. <laughs> really happened last night. <laughs> uh huh. Ross invited us all to watch. Now here's one with TikTok's resident goober and glorified laugh track, Ventilex. Great class. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, I was watching. <laughs> I tried attacking two women. Did not work. <laughs> Facts. That isn't part of my conspiracy, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. By the way, like Amy Schumer, I'm a failed comedian myself, and I'm hoping my poor execution, dry and completely offensive humor can someday make it on this platform. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I'll promise not to talk about my used up and aging vagina. The point I'm trying to make is that this show just wasn't funny and that it was a 30 year long social experiment to test the government's control over popular opinion using hypnotic race to influence the viewers opinions and the control of this crazy experiment being a terrible show that no one could possibly like. There, I said it. I wish I was joking, 
but I'm not. Don't get me wrong, though. It wasn't all bad. The cast was fine, and I'll admit, I don't know where I'd be in life without Matthew Perry's performance as Benny. Ring a ding ding, baby. I think David Schwimmer went to directing, but I thought that was because he finally realized he looked like a saggy piece of foreskin hanging from a clothesline in a gentle summer breeze. Matt LeBlanc played a struggling, out of work actor with shit roles and appearances, and then his real life started to mirror that. His only notable appearances were anything David Crane would put him in in Top Gear. The show makes sense as a concept from the 90s. A group of friends on their own in the real world, just trying to figure shit out from the comfort of a crappy little coffee shop. But to anyone my age or younger, you couldn't sell that idea unless you crammed the six cast members into a one-bedroom apartment working 72 hours a week and still struggling to afford food and having their utilities shut off every couple of months. By the way, that coffee shop, Central Perk, has a website dedicated to the popularity of Friends. They sell ground coffee with cute little references to the show that make me sick to my stomach. I don't think they're doing too well, though, because they're still trying to get rid of this pumpkin spice holiday promotion that was only for a limited time. You know, now that I think about it, maybe they should make a reboot of that series. By the end of it, they just run out of money and eat Phoebe. Her guitar is used as kindling for a fire in the apartment so the friends can huddle around to keep warm. Now that sounds like a wholesome ending. It's not my place to say, but it was a show I definitely could have lived without, and I think a lot more of you would agree. Whether or not this is a social trend centered around a generation that wants to feel more mature by watching the shows their parents watch, or a government mind control test to see if they can make us cool about dropping another nuke and starting World War III, it was definitely an anomaly. We do have a massive population of people watching family and prank channels though, so maybe I should consider that a lot of people are just f***ing stupid. Eh, whatever. I'm watching you, lizard people. Hey, thanks for watching the full rant. If you did enjoy, consider subscribing and helping me reach my completely realistic goal of being famous and taking advantage of YouTube's ad revenue system. Also, help me in the analytics by liking, sharing, and letting me know which friends, characters you hated the most, and why. I'll feature the best in my next video. Until then, be well.